Hello and welcome to another managerial special from the Unsport Podcast. I'm Craig Savage, back after missing the last two managerial specials while on the holiday. And joining me as always is Mr. Daniel Cody. Uh, today we're talking about the hiring, the sacking and the hiring of Gareth Ainsworth, sacked hiring of Marty Sipawentes at QPR. So it's all changing again at QPR because they've done two last season. Um, let's talk about Gareth Ainsworth to start with. Um, we thought this could have been the right move to start with, but yeah, it did not go well at all. No, it really didn't. And there were problems early on, weren't there? We saw some of the stuff that came out of the training ground, lots of reports that players weren't on side. And let's be fair about it here. I go back a little bit maybe to the Southampton one we did in the summer where behind the scenes, the club is completely changing the style with every appointment. And it's a sort of similar story at QPR. They were going really well under Mark Warburton and obviously decided to let him go after many years of stability, missing out on the playoffs after a, a big injury crisis at the end of the 22 season. Then last year, it just became a mixed match. You had this Mick Beal, passive all-possession football, which started great but fell away even before he left. The Neil Cretchley spell, which was sort of in between the two, but was a solid appointment, we thought, just ended up being a disaster. And then Ainsworth came in as a club legend, probably as the type of manager you thought would play the football that would keep them up, but wouldn't really be a QPR style traditionally. And he's really struggled as well. Yes, they stayed up in the end last season. And let's yes. be honest, it yeah, I was going to say it was made more comfortable yes. by other teams having points deductions and things as well. If Redden then got that second one, etc., it could have been a lot tighter. And this season, I looked at the start of the summer. There were a few injuries at centre half. They struggled to put a, a full 11 out the first day of the season with defenders. And then they recruited some quite clever players. They recruited experience in the core of the team. The likes of Jack Colback, Asmir, Begovic, Steve Cook, etc. And you thought, right, this is going to start to take shape now. And it's just been all over the place. And the biggest problem for me when I look at it, conceding two goals within five minutes, it's happened so many times this season. They're top of the stats for conceding multiple goals in a 10-minute spell. They've had four red cards in their last nine games, which is just a lack of discipline. Even against Leicester at the weekend, they're actually doing all right at 1-0. Andre Dezel loses his head. He goes absolutely mad. Don't know what he's doing. And he goes on to lose the game. There was a lack of discipline. There was a lack of goal threat, which... I think is maybe the one thing we might have predicted that could have happened to the Gareth Ainsworth side. And they just looked disjointed. They didn't look like they were ever cohesive or playing for the manager. And in the end, it sort of felt like a sense of inevitability. I think we both thought that they might kick on and just about be all right this year. But it's been a very tough start. It's not worked out for Gareth Ainsworth. And maybe in hindsight, you look at it and think, given the fact they haven't had the full overhaul, of course, there was the chaos off the pitch. There's Ferdinand leaving in the summer. He'd been in place for years. That Let's just be fair and say it's not just on the pitch. There's problems at QPR. There has been a, a disjointed approach across the boardroom and behind the scenes. But it's not worked out. I feel that they've obviously gone for a new appointment we'll talk about in a minute. That's a bit closer to the style they were perhaps playing under Warburton for years and what they were looking to do there, progressing and developing younger players. But... I think the the only thing that hasn't surprised me at all with this, to be honest, Craig, is the timing of it. Because you look after the Leicester and West Brom games and you look at the fixtures they've got in their next nine, there's four or five massive games at the bottom. And I think the timing of it, I mean, I actually predicted it in Saturday morning's live stream and said it would happen after the Leicester game. It was predictable. And they've got a huge couple of weeks now under their new man. Do you think it was too long for... Uh... QPR to finally bite the bullet on Gareth Ainsworth, or do you think he could have gone a little bit earlier, considering the circumstances? Obviously, how cut adrift QPR are in the in the bottom of the table. It's hard to tell, really, isn't it? Because you look back at the September international break, and actually they went into that with a really good win away at Middlesbrough, and maybe I know it was a bit of a smash and grab win, but gave them a little bit of false hope. But then you look at the October international break, which would have been the next opportunity. And after that, yes, they had Huddersfield, but then it was West Brom and Leicester. And if you want a new manager to come in, do you want them to come in when they've got the best chance at a bounce? So maybe looking at who it is as well and the fact that their club is at the end of a season, which is winter to winter league there, maybe it just made it a bit more sense if that was the man they always wanted. But I'm not surprised it took that long. I can see why they wanted to give a, a club legend a chance. I can see why they wanted to give him a few weeks to settle his signings in and given the injuries they had at the back at the start. But the last couple of games, once you see the ill-discipline, the red card in each, you see the 
the disjointed performances. I mean, they're not scoring goals either. It was inevitable, but I can understand why it's happened now. Maybe it could have happened a little sooner in the international break, but I kind of understand the timing, if I'm honest. Uh, right, let's move on to the new man in charge, head coach, Marty Sifuentes. He's come from uh, Swedish side Hammarby. Um, QPR statement from the CEO, Lee Hughes, says, uh, we are delighted to bring in Marty in. Uh, Marty is an exciting appointment and we look forward to seeing the impact he can have. Having a succession plan in place is a necessary part of football, irrespective of how the team are performing. Marty is someone we have been aware of, so we are really pleased to have been able to secure his services. Uh, Sifuente has, has previously coached in the Netherlands, Spain, Sweden, Norway and Denmark. Uh, he will take charge in the first game against Rotherham pending a work permit. Um, completely different style, should we say. Uh, QPR went for the old British way, the direct style of football, but it seems that Sifuente has obviously with that uh, European connection right won a play possession baseball like kind of like McBeal had and play up in the back he might actually give some players some key players i.e. Ilias Chair be that main man again yeah it's quite an interesting appointment he's actually a man who interviews quite well I've seen I've been watching a few of him and trying to get a bit of an understanding of him and he's quite an interesting character actually because he's talked about obviously you can see he's gone and worked in lots of different nations from a very early age I think when he was in the Spanish third tier, he was the youngest coach in Spain at the time, or head coach, certainly. Um, and he's obviously moved around Scandinavia and talked about the different influences there. And actually, he mentioned Sweden having quite a big influence still from the Roy Hodgson era over there, which was quite interesting with a lot of teams playing 4-4-2. But something that I didn't realise till I was doing my reading up on him is he'd actually done a, a bit of work at Millwall with Kenny Jacket when they were in League One. So he's actually been involved and seen English football before. And he does seem to be a man that's while he's got his style and his clear imprint of how he wants to play, which I think you're probably right, is a lot closer to their traditional imprint under Warburton and then McBeal. I think he has been a man that's been happy to embrace other cultures and take the best bits from it, which seems to have helped him do a successful job elsewhere. I mean, we, we mentioned it off camera before. He's not a man that many had heard of previously. It actually come up to me purely because he'd been linked with a Hearts job and in live streams, Hearts fan had mentioned him and, were a bit upset not to get him given what had happened since and they've had a struggle in start to the season. But he's a manager who did a good job at Hammerby and the biggest thing he did, which I think was probably the biggest strength of QPR for a few years under Warburton, is he developed players and he improved them. And in the year Hammerby finished third, they then lost seven or eight of their 11 the year after that were all picked off by bigger clubs across Europe or from different nations and opportunities. But he's a manager who improves players and that's probably why he's going to be a useful head coach. The man management skills and things in England are always a bit trickier to judge. We've seen both sides of that at Luton with Nathan Jones and then Graham Jones, probably, I think it's fair to say. But it's, it's going to be an interesting one because it's definitely more of a return to what they were doing for many a year when they were stable. But we mentioned the fact they've had the changes off the pitch with Les Ferdinand going as well. They've recruited a side and certainly a spine of a team that is made for Gareth Ainsworth, is made to be compact, is made to be direct probably isn't the most energetic and high tempo, but they've got players who can play football in there. And as you mentioned, they've got those sparks of magic in the team. So it's going to be interesting to see what Savuentes does from now to January. But I do feel it's more of a an inline appointment for QPR and what they've been doing in recent seasons. And I feel for him, particularly at Hammerby, did a very good job. He's generally got a good win rate everywhere he's been, but the Hammerby one interested me the most because everyone talks about him keeping possession, playing football, and he talks about it himself. But the biggest thing that changed when he went to Hammerby, they let in nearly half the amount of goals the season after. So he definitely makes an impact at that side, whether he focuses on it or not. But for QPR, I just feel they've tried a few different things. It hasn't worked. And they've basically gone back to the tried and trusted and with the hope that they'll probably get back to where they were under Warburton. And as I said, all the way back then, they should have just stuck with bloody Warburton. Well, yeah, his contract was up and uh, didn't have to pay up any money for the sacking. But they'd um, be happy to just miss out on the playoffs now, wouldn't they? Yeah, and but they, obviously they paid up more money for sacking previous two. So um, moving on to their fixtures uh, for, for November, as it's now the end of October at the time of recording. Uh, massive game on Saturday. Robin United away, obviously team that's down in the bottom three. Mangelis, Bristol City at home. 
Uh, Norwich are on a poor run um, away after the international break. And then Stoke City at home on the 28th. Looking at the month of November, how many points do you see QPR getting? Has to be quite a few, quite simply, to be honest with you. I mean, the biggest problem has been home form for them all season. They've got one point at Loftus Road. One point. It's a ridiculous total. They've got Bristol City and Stoke in the next two home games, as you mentioned. Massive games for them. And they've got to get Loftus Road excited again. They've got to get it full. They've got to get it bounced. And it can be one of the most exciting and intimidating places in English football when it's rocking because it's such a tight and closed pitch. It's a cracking old-fashioned ground. But they've had nothing to cheer about this season. So if they can keep the ball, if they can create chances, he's got a chance to get them on board quickly. And even extending slightly what you've said, going through their first eight games, we talked about the timing. Even before Christmas in December, they've got Plymouth and Sheffield Wednesday who came up as well. So it's a huge spell of games for them. They've actually been a lot better on the road this season. Whether that will change now with a possession style, I don't know. But you look at that spell and you look at the fact that they're already, what, six points from safety. You've got to think they've got to make at least five or six this month, haven't you? Otherwise, you're going to start to look really tricky. They've got to be in the mix and they've got to be closer than they are now when they get to January to give Sifuentes a chance. We're probably going to see two or three additions. Be very surprised if we don't see a few more technical players coming on loan in January. But you look away at Rotherham, you look particularly at home at Bristol City and uh, Stoke at the end of this month. There's got to be five points for me out of that at the very minimum. And more importantly, there's got to be encouraging signs in performances and a bit more of a goal threat because they've got some good attacking players there. And at the moment, they don't look like they can hit a barn door, which is quite a scary thought, really. You mentioned the uh, January transfer window. Um, do you think the head coach will look at his try and trust it, like looking at players in Sweden who we've seen over the last couple of years or like, of the Scandinav- uh, Scandinavian area? Or do you think he might go with what his scouts have got in England and might go for a couple of players from League 1, League 2? Well, yeah, I guess one of the benefits of the fact that he's worked in so many different places in Europe is he's got a lot of knowledge and he's got a lot of contacts across European football. I mean, as I mentioned, the Hammerby one's a bit trickier because most of his best squad was taken away from him last season after they finished third. But he's got to tap into something because we know that behind the scenes at QPR with Ferdinand moving on, a couple of the scouting team have been shuffled around as well. There's not quite the recruitment team that was there before, and there has been a lot of changes there too. So I wonder if there'll be further arrivals or changes on that front. But they've got to do something in January because they've scored 10 goals in 14 games. I know part of that will be the style, but behind Linden Dykes, they've got a lot of younger players, a lot of maybe less consistent players. I think we're probably going to see quite a busy January, but then you look at that table at the minute, certainly the bottom three, Sheffield Wednesday with Danny Roll, a very similar change for them. They're going to be looking to be very busy and you're going to have a few just out the side the relegation zone that may well panic. So I think it's going to be a really busy January transfer window generally in a championship. But I think QPR will be a big part of that. And if one or two of those who were maybe outliers and were suggested to be not on board with Gareth Ainsworth don't come into the line now, you look at Willock and Chair and people like that, they should enjoy this style more. But if they don't get going and if they don't progress now, does he sell one or two to be able to bring in three, four or five players that he knows in January? I don't know. But I, I think it's going to depend on how the next two months goes because they've got a real chance with their fixtures to get an awful lot closer. Uh, let's have a prediction then because there's no time uh, frame on that statement of how many years he's got um, under um, on his contract. So how do you think he would do? Obviously, we said he needs to get these points straight away. Uh, how do you think he'll do for the rest of the season? Do you think he'll last to get to the re- uh, end of the season if his form is not good? And if you think he does, how long do you think he'll have afterwards? I'll stick with what I said at the start of the season, which is I think QPR will stay up fairly narrowly. Um If I were them, I wouldn't want it to go to the last three games because they've got Preston Leeds and then Coventry away on the final day, which is not a nice finish for anyone. But they've got a lovely spell just before that. Um, I think they stay up. I still think Sheffield Wednesday and Rotherham are the two weakest sides in the division on paper. And I do feel that there's not a great deal if QPR can get into form between them and maybe some of those not much further above. You look at Huddersfield, you look at uh, Plymouth as well, who have come up and not been able to be consistent uh, I think they stay up just but 
it's not going to be easy. There's going to be a lot of change. And going on to your second question, I know normally we say no because managers aren't generally given time in a championship, but QPR of are probably the best example and metaphor for what we always say about giving managers time and having stability at a club because they had four or five years under Warburton, were progressing every year, were on the cusp of the playoffs. And if it weren't for an injury crisis, they would have made it that year, quite frankly. They went for about seven goalkeepers or something ridiculous that season. And now they've gone through three managers in a season and they've been in a relegation scrap. So now they be careful what you wish for. Let's hope Sifuentes is the right man. And if he keeps you up this season, back him in the summer window, let him bring in his type of player, let him develop people and build the club again. Because... QPR is a club that desperately needs a bit of stability. And while I don't know whether this will be the right appointment in terms of a man, manager and person, I don't know enough about him to say. The one thing that's very clear from watching clips of his sides, the way they play and the way he interviews, is very much more of a return to the style that they had under Warburton when they were stable and successful. So that's a positive sign for me. Looks like they found their identity again, but the proof will be on the pitch. And with the squad he's got at the minute, it's probably going to be a bit of a test for him for the next couple of months. Yeah, I think like he has to close the gap straight away because at the moment that gap is a bit too big. Yeah, um, I think it's harder, especially where there's two other teams by you who are on the same points and they got to climb up the table as well. So yeah, he has to get off to a good start for me. Where if he does lose that first game, that confidence is really low as it is. It, it could take a while for them to get that how he wants to play to gel because there's no confidence in that team. Yes, certain players might get back in, as you said, but it, it's all about, the, I think, the confidence and the style, how he wants. If he gets that win on Saturday against Rotherham, yeah, then they can start progressing. But it, for me, I still worry about QPR. I, I think the gap's too big at the moment. I know it's very, I know there's loads of games left uh, and a transfer window, but it's just, at the moment, it's a bit too big for my liking. But he needs to get off to a good start and there'll be more pressure if he doesn't get off to a good start. And I suppose it does depend who half the other clubs down there are point who are all sacking their managers at the minute. So. Well, this is the thing. We've already got one, well, Sheffield Wednesday have already um, sacked and reappointed and then they'll probably get a points deduction now because there'll probably be another, another embargo for them. Um, Huddersfield as well have done it already. And there's two more to go. Yeah, obviously Birmingham have done their bit and um, and obviously Bristol City are going to do that. But obviously they'll make changes soon. Uh, but that is it. That is our chat on uh, the sacking of Gareth Ainsworth and the hiring of Marty Sifuentes at QPR. Let us know down in the comments how you think he will get on, uh, not only for his first game in charge, but for the rest of the season. Uh, don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the Honest Football Podcast, and you can follow us on Twitter X at Honest Football Free. And you can also check us on TikTok and Instagram, and you can check Daniel Cody's Twitch as well, all in the description down below. And we'll see you next time.